The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Anything that you do for any creature, for any person who is hurting to relieve their suffering, you've done something to lighten the load of pain that God feels in this world. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Sacramento Central Study Hour video series. Today's lesson is lesson number 12 in our study guide dealing with mission and commission. The memory verse is Luke 24 verse 46. Luke 24 46. And uh, I hope you'll say that with me, okay? Give me some backup here. Ready? Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now, the central theme of the study today is dealing with this. What part do works of charity have in the life of those who are disciples? Now, probably the best story to help illustrate this is in Matthew 25, verse 31. So take your Bibles right now. And while you're turning, uh, keep in mind, Matthew 25 comes after Matthew 24. What is the theme of Matthew 24? This is the great discourse where Jesus talks about the signs and things that were to precede his coming. It's in the context of the second coming. And if your Bible is red letter edition, you'll notice that you've got red letter going all the way from Matthew 25, 4 into Matthew 25, meaning there's no narration or interruption that Matthew 25 is part of Christ's discourse on the second coming. It was all part of the same delivery. Keep that in mind just for context of what we're going to look at. So the last thing Jesus says in his discourse of Matthew chapter 25, uh, the second coming, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, is this parable we're now going to look at. So it's telling us about one of the last things, a great judgment. It's sort of the, the dividing qualifiers in the great judgment. Now let me read this to you with that uh, background. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, still talking about His coming, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Christ is now glorified. This is happening at the end of the 1,000 years when He's received His kingdom. You've got the righteous in the city, the wicked outside the city. There's a separation that takes place here. And all the nations will be gathered before Him. All who have ever lived are gathered before him. Now they are not separated based upon are they Jews and are they Gentiles, are they church members, are they non-church members. It's very interesting, almost troubling parable about how he discriminates between these two groups. And he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left hand. Now sheep and goats have some things in common. They're domestic animals and when they shepherds sometimes might graze them together and they were preoccupied with eating and they'd get along but uh, they would not put them in the fold together because they, the, the goats had a tendency to take advantage of the sheep and uh, were a little more violent. They were commingled for a while while they were out there in the field but then at the end of the day they're separated. So this was an analogy that uh, the listeners were well familiar with. This is a type of the great judgment. And the king will say to those on the right hand, now in the Bible what does the right hand symbolize? Favor, approval, the son of my right hand would be favor. Left hand also often represented something that was rejected. Usually the right hand was your hand that you favored for most people. 
and so it became synonymous with the hand that you favored. Also, it was stronger. Most people are right-handed. If you're right-handed, your right arm is usually stronger than your left arm. You will be able to hang from your right arm longer than you can hang from your left arm. And so the right hand represented strength. It represented favor. And so when he separates the goats and the sheep, sheep are on the right hand, a place of favor. I can't prove it. But in my mind, the two thieves that were crucified, one on the right hand, one on the left, when Jesus was crucified, one is saved, one is lost. It'll be interesting to find out the thief that repented and was saved. I'd like to think he was on the right hand. Can't prove it. Doesn't ever say that, but um, that would just give you the picture here. Oh, by the way, in the great judgment we're talking about here, at the end of the 1,000 years, everybody here, everybody watching is all present and accounted for. Everybody involved in the plan of salvation. All of the good angels are with Christ in the city. All of the wicked angels, including the devil, are outside of the city. Satan is loose from his prison and all his angels because now the wicked are resurrected and they can tempt and manipulate them. All the wicked who've ever lived are outside the city, meaning everybody who's ever lived involved in the plan of salvation is present, and there's a great separation that happens. Not so much on the right or left hand, but you got the saved in the city, the lost outside the city. This is the context of, of this parable. And the king will say to those on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit. Who inherits something? Strangers or family? These are the children. If, if you're going to get an inheritance, you've got to be part of the family. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become sons. So by receiving him, he adopts us. We become children. We inherit something. The others are not uh, receiving this inheritance. Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In Revelation, it talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What makes us qualified for that inheritance? The sacrifice of the lamb from the foundation of the world, the blood of the lamb. Amen? Four, and here he goes on and says something. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And here is the, uh, the, the bottom line of this passage. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, here you've got a central teaching of discipleship. Christ is saying we demonstrate genuine discipleship in how we treat each other. And they are being judged by what? How do you treat your brother? How do you treat your sister? Do you love? Do you care for others? Now, I've got a few verses that I'd like you to read that help us recognize this. Acts 9, the book of Acts 9, 4 and 5. And I think we may have distributed that to somebody. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. All right, this takes place after Saul has been an accessory to the stoning of Stephen, and he is now on his way to arrest the followers of Jesus. Jesus appears. Was Saul arresting Jesus or his followers? It wasn't Jesus physically. Was he persecuting Jesus or his followers? Well, technically his followers, but how does Christ view it? He says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. In doing this to them, you're doing it to me. So that establishes a principle that's very real. What we do to one another, we directly do to Christ. I was going to say indirectly, but not really. Because the church is the body of Christ. And we show our love for Christ in how we treat the lost. And so what we're doing to our fellow man made in the image of God, we are doing to the creator 
of our fellow man. It's very real. Now, we've talked about his passage to the righteous. Now go to verse 41. Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This is that fire spoken of in Revelation 20. The devil and his angels are cast into this lake of fire, which is the second death. The results of this fire are everlasting. There is no resurrection. There is no second chance from this fire. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? He answered and says to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Wow, that's heavy. Let me tell you why. What is the criteria that is being used in this judgment? Is it the sinners go into eternal life or eternal judgment and the righteous into eternal life? Or is it those who have neglected to love their fellow man? Uh, let me make that more clear. You've got two kinds of sin. Really, you've got the sins of neglect they're called sins of omission, and then you have sins of commission. When the man fell among thieves on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and the Levite and the priest walked by him, they did not beat up the man or steal from him. They did not rob him and wound him. They just walked by. They didn't lay a hand on him. Doesn't say they said anything to him. But did they sin? What was their sin? A sin of commission or a sin of omission? It was a good duty they neglected to do. When we think of the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not... And as we go through the Ten Commandments, we think, As long as I don't commit these sins, then I'm holy. This parable is telling us it's not just an action, it's an attitude. It's not just, I won't sin because of what's in it for me. It's an attitude of, am I living the Christian life because I love my fellow man? The bottom line in the judgment is not sins of commission. It's actions of love or neglect of love. That's really heavy because so often we, we think about, you know, it's based upon am I doing the right thing or am I doing the wrong thing? Have I committed any sins? But here it's not the sins that they commit. It's the good deeds they neglect. I mean, some of us, at the end of the day, we might be able to count, you know, did I do this wrong or did I do that wrong? We got the list of, oh, you know, I lost my temper here. I said something. I shouldn't. I broke this commandment, this commandment. But have you often thought about neglected opportunities to serve and to love your fellow man, to glorify God? This is what he's using. He does not say, those who are children of Abraham enter into eternal life because of your membership, because of your race, because of your creed. Those who are not, you didn't join, and so you're lost. This judgment completely throws out your membership. It, it, now, I would like to think that Christians, those who have Christ inside, would be at the forefront of acts of mercy. But that's not what he's saying here in this parable, is it? Let me... Uh, expand this a little bit and give you something else to think of. There are six things. I held up four fingers and I said six. There are six things that uh, Jesus mentions here. Notice hunger, thirst, stranger, naked, sick, prison. He specifically mentions these things like three times in the one parable. And he doesn't deviate because they have a spiritual and a physical analogy. Now, first of all, I think everybody here agrees that good disciples do care about the practical needs of our fellow man. Isn't that right? But wait, there's more. Look at those six things that we mentioned. 
Are Christians supposed to give food to the hungry? How about the bread of life? So it's both. Are Christians supposed to give water to the thirsty? Doesn't Jesus say if you give a cup of water to one of the least of these, you'll not lose your reward? But are we to give the living water? Is there a spiritual analogy for that? Are we to have compassion on the stranger, people who are alone? Yeah. But what about those who are alienated from God? They're strangers to God. We are a nation of priests. We are to make atonement. We're to bring them to God, right? What about those who are naked? Should we clothe the naked and people who are cold and destitute? But what about providing robes of righteousness of Christ? Isn't that part of it, that kind of clothing? What about those who are sick physically? Of course, we should care about them. But what about the sickness of sin? It says from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot, it's a disease and wounds and bruises, and we should care about binding up those wounds. And then the sixth one is I was in prison. Does everyone here know that that's an analogy for being imprisoned by the devil and habits and addictions and helping them find liberty? Jesus came to set the captives free. This is the whole plan of salvation in the Exodus. He came to set a nation free from slavery. We should be part of that. So all of these things in discipleship they have a spiritual analogy. analogy. Hungry, food, the bread of life. Thirsty, the living water. Stranger, introduce them to Christ. They're separated by their sins. Naked, robed with Christ's righteousness. Sick with sin, help them find healing with the balm from Gilead. Imprisoned by the devil, find liberty and freedom through Christ. Jesus opened prison doors, right? So there's the spiritual analogies. But wait, there's more. This is a great parable. Keep in mind, this is the closing words of Christ in Matthew 24 dealing with the second coming. He's saying, this is what the essence is in the big judgment. Do you really love your neighbor? If you really love me, prove it. Don't live for yourself. Live for others. He that seeks to save his life will lose it. Jesus said, and as much as you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. I'd venture to say that a lot of us pass by Jesus every day. And we neglect to show the love of God for Jesus in the suffering we see in our fellow man. Now, I used to think that this was sort of a metaphor. Jesus really meant this. Let me explain. Does God know how you feel? At any given moment, is God aware of the feeling of everybody in this room? Even when you forget about how you feel, does he know how you feel? Even when you're not focusing on how you feel, he knows how you feel. Does God feel when you're hungry? He knows how hungry you really are. Now, did Jesus come to earth so he'd know how humans feel? Or did he already know? The Bible says we have a faithful high priest that was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. But that's more for our benefit than his. He wants us to know that he knows how we feel. He already knew because he's God. Does God sense every sensation in the world all at the same time? Think about this. This is heavy. By the way, I'm not teaching pantheism. This is clean Christian theology, but it's, think about it. Because God's all-knowing. He's all-feeling. So, how much suffering is there in the world today? You take all the collective suffering of everybody in this room and all those who are watching right now, all the suffering, the war in the world, the pain in the hospitals, the hunger in the world, the sickness in the world, the shame, the loneliness. Take all of that. And how much suffering is that? That's a lot of hurt. I mean, you and I can't comprehend that. Anything that you do for any creature, for any person who is hurting to relieve their suffering, you've done something to lighten the load of pain that God feels in this world. Isn't that true? Does the Lord know when someone starts feeling better? And anything you do to make a person feel better, God senses that because He feels everything. Is, that, is this straight so far? Now, this is where I think I'm taking it down to what I think is the most important part of this passage. Why did Jesus die? Didn't he die for the sins of the world? To take the penalty of sin. 
did Jesus just die at, or did he suffer first? Christ in these six points identified what he went through on the cross, how he took the suffering of the whole human race and the sin and the loneliness and the sickness and the hunger and the thirst. He took it all in the cross. So if you love Jesus because he took all your pain, if you're a real disciple of Jesus, anything you do for your fellow man to bring them the bread of life or literal bread, to give them the living water or li literal water, to clothe them with the righteousness of Christ or to clothe their bodies. They may not be converted. Anything you do to relieve the suffering of man, that's what real discipleship is. Because you in your heart see that God senses that. And that's why Christ says, and as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. That's such an important teaching. So, as we go from this place today, how are we really disciples? We say we're members of a specific church. That means I'm a disciple. Is that what Jesus is going to use? You might be a goat. <laughs> you could be a member of a church and just be a plain old goat. And let's all face it, some people who say they're Christians are goats. They're just ornery and stubborn and um, opinionated, and they do nothing to relieve the suffering of the world around them. All right, James chapter 2, verse 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, but you don't give them the things that are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith itself does not that does not have works is dead. A lot of us say we go to church and we believe and we pray, but we walk by and walk away from people who have basic needs and we just don't seem to care. Let me read this for you. Closing words of Jesus in Mark 16, verse 14. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's sort of a broad term. He doesn't just say every person. He says every creature. You know, the only way we can preach the gospel to every creature is by showing the love of Christ to every living being. What kind of witness are you to your bird? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, really, Christians should, we should show our religion even to the creatures. That's what he says. Preach the gospel to every creature. Now, you know another reason I think the, the word creature was used there? Because the Jews actually believed that Gentiles were dogs. And here, nobody could misunderstand the words of Jesus. Preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Through your preaching, many will believe, not all. That's why he says whoever believes. And then, of course, believing was connected with baptism. They'll be saved. That means that God delivers the keys of the kingdom to you. Not that you decide who's saved and lost, except as you preach the gospel. Through your preaching the gospel, and how do you preach the gospel? How many preachers do we have here? Every disciple should have raised their hands. You hear that? Preach Christ, and if necessary, use words. Everybody should preach Christ by our lives that we live, right? So everybody here, you're preaching whether you know it or not. People are watching, too when you least expect it. Where was I? Oh, and he says, uh, whoever believes is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. So what was it that disqualified them? Not being baptized or not believing? The belief was the emphasis here. John 3, 14, As most, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Says it almost identically again. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at that. Believe, 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 believe. What's the emphasis of this passage? How do you identify true disciples? What do they believe? 
But is that belief verbal? Or did we learn from Matthew 25 it's more than just saying, I believe, uh, you count on me, vote me as one believer. How do you demonstrate real belief? Remember, the word believe means to be live. The word believe has live in it. It means we're lifting them up in our lives. That's what true belief is. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Do you love the Lord so much that if everybody in this church was to give up their faith, would you still keep it? Do I love the Lord so much I would rather die than disobey Him? It's those who are studying now for the little quizzes that will pass the final. World events have never been more unstable than today. Terrorism, disasters, bizarre weather. What does the Bible reveal about future events? Learn the amazing answer in this stunning documentary entitled The Final Events of Bible Prophecy. During this special broadcast, you can get your very own copy of this gripping DVD. You pay only $15.99 for shipping and handling. Go to the phone and call the number on the screen. Don't miss out on this special offer. If you've been encouraged by today's message and would like to know more of what God's Word says to you today, Amazing Facts invites you to visit our educational website at www.bibleuniverse.com. At Bible Universe, you'll discover exciting truths that will fill you with peace and purpose. The mysteries of the Bible will unfold for you at your own pace. Visit www.bibleuniverse.com today. Expand your universe. Friends, one of the greatest tasks for a Christian is to share his or her faith. Unfortunately, today with all the distractions in the world, it's becoming less common for Christians to do any real witnessing. Maybe you fall in this category, or maybe you've been excited, but you're not sure how to share your faith. We know there are Christians today that live in a hostile environment where it's becoming less acceptable to be a witness. That's why we're offering you right now a special book entitled Christ's Way of Making Disciples. This book explores the progressive steps taken by Jesus so many years ago that revolutionized the world. Please call our toll-free number and ask right now for offer number 286. Or if you prefer, visit the website at amazingfacts.org. You can also still write us at Amazing Facts. Ask for offer number 286, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, time has escaped us for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until we meet again, remember Jesus is the truth that will set you free. The preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Now, the central theme of the study today is dealing with this. What part do works of charity have in the life of those who are disciples? Now, probably the best story to help illustrate this is in Matthew 25, verse 31. So take your Bibles right now, and while you're turning... Uh, keep in mind, Matthew 25 comes after Matthew 24. What is the theme of Matthew 24? This is the great discourse where Jesus talks about the signs and things that were to precede his coming. It's in the context of the second coming. And if your Bible is red letter edition, you'll notice that you've got red letter going. The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents. Anything that you do for any creature, for any person who is hurting to relieve their suffering, you've done something to lighten the load of pain that God feels in this world.
For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, still talking about His coming, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Christ is now glorified. This is happening at the end of the 1,000 years when He's received His kingdom. You've got the righteous in the city, the wicked outside the city. There's a separation that takes place here. And all the nations will be gathered before Him. All who have ever lived are gathered before Him. Now they are not separated based upon are they Jews and are they Gentiles, are they church members, are they non-church members. It's very interesting, almost troubling parable about going all the way from Matthew 25, 4 into Matthew 25, meaning there's no narration or interruption that Matthew 25 is part of Christ's discourse on the second coming. It was all part of the same delivery. Keep that in mind just for context of what we're going to look at. So the last thing Jesus says in his discourse of Matthew chapter 25, uh, the second coming, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, is this parable we're now going to look at. So it's telling us about one of the last things, a great judgment. It's sort of the, the dividing qualifiers in the great judgment. Now let me read this to you with that uh, background. Enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Sacramento Central Study Hour video series. Today's lesson is lesson number 12 in our study guide dealing with mission and commission. The memory verse is Luke 24 verse 46. Luke 24 46. And uh, I hope you'll say that with me, okay? Give me some backup here. Ready? Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. 